During today's episode, I'm going to be telling you about a podcast I think you should check out. It's called Uneffing the Republic, and I'm going to tell you about their only episode that doesn't involve swearing. So keep an ear out for that mid-show when I tell you all about it. And now, welcome to this episode of the award-winning Best of the Left podcast, in which we shall take a look at the new Texas abortion restrictions and the response from the Supreme Court, along with lots of contextualizing commentary, taking us back to the Fugitive Slave Act and all the way through to the strain of patriarchal white terrorism that is at the core of the current conservative movement. Clips today are from Counterspin, Amicus, The Takeaway, The Tom Hartman Program, and Gaslit Nation. Well, I'd like to ask you first about Senate Bill 8, or the Texas Heartbeat Act itself. How does deputizing and incentivizing people to sue anyone they believe aided and abetted an abortion, how is that different than a ban on those abortions? What's the legal maneuvering going on here? It's clearly strategic. It is strategic, Janine, because generally statutes provide for causes of action in court to be brought by the government. But then people can sue the government. And so in order to get around that, what this Texas SB 8 is doing is to deputize private people to act as vigilantes and sue abortion providers and those who aid and abet them. Now, that could include doctors, nurses, friends, spouses, parents, domestic violence counselors, clergy members, Uber drivers, Lyft drivers, they don't even have to know that they are helping a woman to get an abortion as long as an Uber driver knows that he is driving a car and dropping off a woman somewhere. So it's really broad, and what it does is to put a $10,000 bounty plus attorney's fees on any of these aider and aiders and abettors. And so what Texas is doing, in effect, is bribing its residents to sue people who help women get abortions. Well, and I was several articles deep before I learned that the woman seeking an abortion can't be sued. So it really is about the support networks, the very people who have been addressing the fact that women have had a right to abortion without access to abortion. It's really, there's something especially devious and and scary about it. It's insidious because now women in Texas who can afford to travel, say, to California to get a safe abortion will be able to do that. But poor women, undocumented women in rural Texas, people of color in Texas, will have to resort to life-threatening back-alley coat hanger abortions once again, as before Roe v. Wade. And there's another law that people are not talking about that is called SB4, Senate Bill 4 in in Texas, which specifically targets medication abortions, because 60% of early term abortion people who want abortions choose to take a pill rather than have surgery. And what SB4 does, this is actually a criminal statute, creates a felony for providers who prescribe medication abortions after seven weeks of pregnancy, basically double banning abortions in the state. And it also bans abortion-inducing pills from being mailed into Texas. The FDA has approved two drugs for non-surgical abortions, and their guidelines, their 2016 guidelines of the FDA, allows practitioners to provide mifepristone and misoprostol up to 10 weeks gestation. And so SB4 would actually punish someone with a criminal law, state criminal law, for prescribing any of these medications. Well, besides the obvious spur and incentive to vigilantism, the lawmakers have somehow absented themselves from being responsible for the law's 
they make. There's a thing where somehow the folks who made these laws or might enforce them, somehow they've taken themselves out of the equation. What's going on there with lawmakers kind of saying, you can't come back to us when this is problematic? Right. They've had some clever lawyers trying to craft this law in a way that is not going to be successfully challenged in the courts. Now, interestingly, as we're speaking, the Department of Justice, Merrick Garland, the Attorney General, who should have been on the Supreme Court, actually, and uh, I think this case, we wouldn't even be talking about this case right now, in all likelihood, but the Justice Department sued the state of Texas to block this Senate Bill 8, and they are arguing that the law is invalid under the Supremacy Clause, the 14th Amendment. It is preempted by federal law. It violates the doctrine of intergovernmental immunity, and the U.S. government has an obligation to ensure that no state can deprive individuals of their constitutional rights. Now, this lawsuit has just been filed as we speak, and so we'll see what the courts do with it. Also, on the 3rd of September, two days after the five-person right-wing majority of the Supreme Court allowed Texas's SB 8 to go into effect with no lower courts weighing in, without briefing, without oral argument. Two days later, a judge in Austin, Texas, issued a temporary restraining order in favor of Planned Parenthood and against the Texas Right to Life Organization, and it just affects Planned Parenthood and Texas Right to Life. On September 13th, there will be a hearing on a preliminary injunction, and also this Texas Right to Life, and I say so-called because Right to Life is really a misnomer, and uh, many of these people, I'm afraid, are very concerned with the life of the fetus, not so much with the life of the mother, although there is an exception in SB 8 if a woman's health or life is at stake, if the mother needs prenatal care, if the baby's born and needs medical care, health insurance, education, that's socialism. Forget about the right to life. So back to uh, this other development, which is the Texas right to life. They had to close their website after their host, GoDaddy, said that it violated the terms of service. In other words, they were collecting information on someone without their consent. So there is pushback now. There are lawsuits, and I think we're going to see a proliferation of lawsuits, Janine, as well there should be. And keep in mind that the five-person right-wing majority on the Supreme Court, and this excludes Chief Justice John Roberts, who voted with the liberals, he was upset that they didn't even rule on the constitutionality of it. They just let the law go into effect, the five-person right-wing majority, with no briefing, with no oral argument, without seeing what the district court and the court of appeals would do with it. But they did let it go into effect, which is wreaking havoc. Women are freaking out, and so are abortion providers and families and, and uh, everyone else in Texas. But what this does is to give us a pretty strong indication that that when the Supreme Court reconvenes for their new term in October and they take up the case of Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization, which is a Mississippi law banning abortion after 15 weeks, that this right-wing majority of the Supreme Court may well overturn Roe versus Wade. And if that happens, you're going to see these state laws, particularly in red states, proliferate. You're going to see women being charged with crimes for having an abortion. And this is very disturbing. But Donald Trump's installation of three radical right-wing justices, and I use justices advisedly, is paying off. He said he was going to appoint justices who would overturn Roe v. Wade, and it looks, unfortunately and tragically, like that's the direction they're headed. You wrote in Ms. Magazine that this kind of citizen attorney general vigilante law 
has a long and pretty sordid history that harkens back to the Fugitive Slave Acts. Can you talk a little bit about the ways in which this really chimes in the key of some very ugly American history? Yes, this does hark back to some very dark American history and dark American history that has been supported through the United States Supreme Court. So the Fugitive Slave Acts provided for citizen participation in the uh, establishment, the furthering, the preservation of American slavery. Um, It weaponized citizenry, deputized citizens to surveil, to stalk, to apprehend people who were in violation of U.S. laws by escaping themselves out of uh, slavery, out of an inhumane situation. Um, There were bounties that were provided for their success in surveilling and successfully apprehending, obtaining individuals um, who dared to exercise liberty, autonomy, and freedom. And when you think about this Texas law, there are certain analogs that eerily resemble that of the Fugitive Slave Act in that it provides for a right of action of private citizens. It provides for financial remuneration of those uh, citizens who are able to successfully peg uh, someone who has aided or abetted an individual in obtaining an abortion. And what this means with the law written in such broad terms, this could implicate the Uber driver, the Lyft driver, the bus driver, uh, the receptionist that works at an abortion clinic, virtually anybody who has been in the way of the path of a person exercising the constitutional right to terminate a pregnancy. What's interesting about the law, Dahlia, is that um, after Roe v. Wade, there was Planned Parenthood v. Casey. And what comes out of there is that there should be uh, no obstacle placed in the path of a woman in terminating a pregnancy. And Texas has flipped that on its head. Uh, which instead you may sue anybody who aids in a person on the path of terminating a pregnancy. It is a very dangerous law and it is very dangerous and alarming what has happened at the Supreme Court. In January 2021, Counterspin spoke with Kimberly Inez McGuire, executive director of the group Urge, Unite for Reproductive and Gender Equity. We asked her first about how courts have reaffirmed Roe time and again, but that still didn't get at the layers and layers between what the court says women can legally do and what they can actually do. The gulf between the theoretical legality of abortion in this country and the lived experience of people trying to get an abortion is wide and getting wider. And so much of the restrictions on abortion are rendered invisible because they only appear based on who you are, where you live, and frankly, how much money you have in the bank. So when we look at the layers upon layers, we go back to the Hyde Amendment, which is older than I am, and it's a federal policy that prevents Medicaid from covering abortion. And it was passed in short order after the Roe v. Wade decision. And so what happened was the Supreme Court said abortion's legal. Folks rejoiced, right? This was a big deal. And Almost immediately thereafter, the door was closed on any low-income woman who gets her insurance through Medicaid. And so for decades, if you are using Medicaid as your insurance, abortion access is not real to you. We then have seen since 2010 this newer tsunami of abortion restrictions, literally hundreds and hundreds of new abortion laws passed in almost every state in the country. There's a handful of states that have held the line, but all over the country, we are seeing restrictions on who can get an abortion, where they can get an abortion, restrictions designed to shut down clinics, restrictions targeting young people, right? And this has created a labyrinth 
for anyone who's just trying to navigate getting basic health care. And so, again, we, we have this sort of legal fiction of Roe that says abortion is legal, but if you can't afford it, if you are young and can't get your parents to sign off on your decision, if there's not a clinic in your neighborhood, if the clinic in your neighborhood has been shut down by a state legislature that was targeting them, all of these things can become insurmountable barriers in the real life experience of trying to end a pregnancy. Roe versus Wade passed in 1973, and there was Hyde Amendment in 1976. And it's important, I think, to remember that Henry Hyde, the Republican congressman from Illinois, and the supporters of the amendment were very clear that they wanted to make abortion unavailable for all women, but it was only women receiving Medicaid that they had power over. Getting rid of the Hyde Amendment, it's not permanent law. It can be eliminated. That's one concrete action that President-elect Biden could take right now. We are hopeful but cautious. As many folks know, President Biden has had a somewhat public evolution on the Hyde Amendment, where after, frankly, the outcries, nationwide outcries during the campaign, he then made clear that he would be committed to ending the Hyde Amendment. So we're grateful that he took that position publicly, but we also are really clear that accountability is going to be necessary to make sure that promise is kept. And we have seen a few statements from the administration so far around the topic of abortion. They frankly have not gone far enough. The Biden administration statement on the Roe anniversary, in addition to not actually using the word abortion, which is concerning in and of itself, did not make clear a commitment to ending the racist Hyde Amendment, which, as you pointed to, with the pro-abortion rights majority in the House, in the Senate, with the White House, there is no reason that Hyde or any a coverage ban should appear in the next round of federal budget. So now is the time for the lawmakers, the president and those in Congress who have said that they oppose. They've got the power now and people across the country are watching to see how they use that power. I just want to add that Hart just did some research, significant majority, 62 percent of voters favor Medicaid coverage of abortion services as against a 38 percent opposed. There's majority support among men, women, all age groups, all education levels. Words are powerful. It does matter that Biden didn't use the word abortion in his statement on the Roe anniversary. And framing is powerful, which is why I appreciate the way that you and Urge and others describe legal abortion as the floor, not the ceiling, as part of that expansive understanding of reproductive justice. Can you talk a little bit about how we talk about abortion and why it matters? What are you trying to do with that floor, not the ceiling phrase? Absolutely. So I think there's a few key pieces here. One is about how we show respect to people who have had abortions. And first and foremost, those who have had abortions deserve the dignity of recognition. We need to use the word abortion. We need to talk about abortion as necessary health care and as a social good. Anything less, honestly, disregards and disrespects the one in four women in this country who have sought out this health care. So that's the first piece is, is just saying the word abortion, it's not a bad word. It's you know, a word that's saved people's lives and helped shape better futures. The other piece around the floor, not the ceiling, is for people with economic resources, what is a legal right on paper has so much more meaning than for people who are blocked because of economic barriers, because of racial barriers. So we look at something like abortion access even before Roe v. Wade, when abortion was illegal across you know, large swaths of the country, the reality is that women of means have always been able to get abortions. That has always been the reality for people with money. The vision for reproductive justice is not just you have a theoretical right to abortion if you can fight your way through all of the muck and the, the, the restrictions, but reproductive justice means that if you've decided to end a pregnancy, you can do so safely with dignity, without upending your family's economic security, and without being subjected to, frankly, misogynist hate speech and stigma. 
you want to know why I am friends with the folks over at the Unfucking the Republic podcast, just go listen to their recent episode breaking down 9-11. First of all, they were hesitant to even address the 20-year anniversary, as was I, but ultimately decided that it was worth it to try to bring something of value to the conversation. As did we. Ours is just in the works. To me, it is that very hesitancy where you can see that careful thought is at work. A 9-11 episode that retreads well-worn narratives isn't worth your time or mine or that of the UNFTR team. Case in point, they insisted on giving more context to the story than just about anyone else, something I put a high value on myself, with their story starting back on September 11th, 1973. And if you don't know what happened on that date or why it's relevant... You'll just have to go listen now, won't you? So do just that, have a listen, and then subscribe to hear what else they've been cooking up wherever you get your podcast by searching for UNFTR or by clicking through on the link in our show notes. This is a complete disregard as well for the health and safety of the people who are most affected by this. Let's remember that in 2016, in Whole Women's Health v. Hellerstead, Justice Breyer observed, and this was based on a robust empirical record from the district court and from science and evidence through empirical research, that a person is 14 times more likely to die nationwide in the United States by carrying a pregnancy to term than by terminating it. Now, let's add what that looks like in Texas, where the maternal mortality rate is considered amongst the worst, not just in the United States, but in the entire developed world. And then let's add on the layer of race to this too, because nationwide, a Black woman is three and a half times more likely to die than white women who carry pregnancies to term. But when we look at Texas and certain counties and districts in Texas, those percentages dramatically multiply. So in many ways, it is not extreme to say at all that for some women, there was already a death sentence by uh, coercive means of forcing them to carry pregnancies to term that they did not want and that were dangerous to their health. What Texas has shown now is a complete disregard for that. And let's be clear, the statistics on maternal mortality coming out of Texas are coming out of the Texas uh, Department of, of Health and Safety. These are not ones that are being made up by pro-choice groups or anything else. This is Texas's own data about how deadly it is to be in Texas and to be pregnant. And the data from that is actually, sadly, not much different than the infant mortality rate in Texas. It would be great if the Texas legislature prioritized attention to that. The fact that they don't reveals a, an incredible disdain in the, for the lives of the people who can become pregnant. Dr. Mogheri, how would anyone know if someone else had a private medical procedure or surgical procedure? How would someone know that someone has sought an abortion? The scary part is, is that these extremists actually camp out outside of our clinics every single day. And they take pictures of staff. They take pictures of patients. They write down our license plates. They already have an expansive infrastructure across the country for surveillance and harassment of abortion clinic workers and abortion seekers. So how they would know is through their <laughs> expansive surveillance infrastructure that they already have in place. Let me ask a, a follow up to that. What if someone maybe who has a private physician goes into, say, a university hospital and sees their private physician and, and, and is either prescribed the, the pills necessary for a medical uh, a, a abortion or is actually given, say, a DNC, a, a surgical procedure? Does that mean that basically it's only those who can be surveilled who are most vulnerable here? Yes. Yeah, so we're unclear right now who they're going to bring suits against and how. Um, but yeah, 
it is unlikely that a private family physician or OBGYN in their office that is providing um, just individuals in their practice care is going to be found out. But it's also important to remember that in Texas, your regular physician is not technically usually allowed to provide abortion care to you. And so our state has already been regulated to the point that pretty much all abortion care happens within our known clinical settings. Uh So if, yeah, so they have already, they've already thought of that. They've filtered us down to a few spots where um, most, if not all abortions in the state happen. So Dr. Kamara, I'm struck again, Dr. Moyeti said that the primary purpose of this law is to intimidate and frighten. Are you feeling intimidated and frightened? Certainly. Yeah. And I, I totally agree with Dr. Moyeti that to your question before about how would you know or what happens if this, that, the other. And I think just asking those questions is what this law is designed to do, right? It's designed to have folks who may need access to abortion, folks who provide abortion to think about every little thing that could happen and how somebody could find out if you want to continue providing the care that you've been providing and make people feel fear and feel intimidated. So I think even having this conversation and sort of working through these questions and of course the last few months about all the what ifs and how and who and where and what's going to happen, the amount of energy and time that's been put into that is exactly what this law or part of it is designed to do. So feeling fear and intimidation is not a new thing for us that do this work in Texas or places like Texas. We're we're used to it. It doesn't make it easy, um, but it's part of the work here. And I think naming it is part of getting around it. So of course, the fear is there. I, I feel it all the time, but I don't allow the fear to control me. It doesn't serve me. It doesn't help me or the people that I'm trying to take care of. But it's there. And I think some of us feel the fear differently and perhaps more heavily. But for me, the fear is there, but I try to move through it and and recognize that it doesn't serve me. Dr. Moyeti, how does having this bounty uh, essentially placed on on your heads affect physicians' capacity to get insurance in the state of Texas? Yeah, that's a great question and one that we all started grappling with very early on after this law was passed. So um, for now, thankfully, it seems like this is not a malpractice issue at all because it is a civil proceeding. And so currently it has not affected our malpractice carriers. However, it's certainly a concern and I think something that was on their mind in this process. But since it is a civil procedure and it doesn't have anything to do with um, actually with medical care, it is so far out of our purview of our malpractice insurers, but that remains to be seen what will happen. I don't know what will happen if we start getting dozens and dozens of these frivolous lawsuits. What are state medical boards going to say? What are the insurance companies going to say after that? What will the hospitals say that we have privileges at? There is a just endless spiral of thinking through the, con- the career consequences of multiple frivolous lawsuits. I want to really focus in on the fact that the Supreme Court chose to let this bill stand on the basis of a really hyper-technical jurisdictional argument. And I wonder what it signifies to you that this was disposed of in this kind of -of back-of-the-napkin, unsigned order in the middle of the night, on the shadow docket, even as there's a 15-week Mississippi abortion ban case teed up to be heard this fall. This could have been 6-3 on the regular docket with regular briefing and regular argument, and none of that happened. Why? Well, what this does is it shows a disdain uh, in many ways for um, the lives of those who are affected by this Texas law. Now, in this uh, dispatch of less than 72 hours of thought, which is what Justice Kagan said, the uh, majority, which is a conservative majority, uh, ultimately um, aided in gutting Roe v. Wade in the state of Texas. And to your point, 
they did so on this technical ground. Now, if one is to believe that this was the only choice that the Supreme Court had, then we'd have to believe that centuries of jurisprudence mean nothing, including Marbury v. Madison and all of the Supreme Court cases early on centuries ago that established the Supreme Court as the supreme arbiter of the land. Um, And so one can't take seriously the court's failure to intervene in this case. And I think Justice Roberts' dissenting opinion in the case makes that very clear, where he really shreds in many ways his conservative uh, cohorts Um, in the court, uh, making clear that, of course, they could have intervened. And of course, Justice Sotomayor issued a very compelling dissent, as I mentioned, Justice Kagan did as well. But what this allowed was for the Supreme Court, the majority, uh, to come away with clean hands in that they make no argument as to the constitutionality of the law. So they get to appear as if their own priors were not somehow on display in their refusal to impose an injunction in this case. As Rebecca mentioned, this is a long time in coming. And so as we look at the jurisprudence that's been articulated and dissensed by these uh, justices, as we look at their private uh, leanings, such as Justice Amy Coney Barrett and the advertisements that she has signed on to, the speeches that Justice Alito has given, uh, the dissents and concurrences coming from uh, Justice Clarence Thomas, that this too has been a victorious moment for them. And let's be clear that this is part of a very well-oiled machine. And part of this machine has been the lifting of the Federalist Society that has played an enormous, in fact, an outsized role and who sits on the bench today, uh, let's be clear that there are a number of movements that come together to put us in this particular space. The decades-long anti-abortion movement, which has been well-oiled and well-funded with some of the sharpest legal minds paid a lot of money to help along this vein. And we see that in the Mississippi case. We see that in the uh, Texas legislation here. That movement has also affected who sits on the bench as well. When Donald Trump was in office as president, he was able to nominate more judges to the federal bench than any other president, save George Washington. Uh, Most of those uh, judges that he uh, nominated were already filtered through the most conservative filter ever. Those are people who are on the court and on the Fifth Circuit as well. And so we can't see the Supreme Court's involvement as just simply isolated from their involvement in social groups. We can't see what Texas, the legislature did as isolated from the broader movement and even isolated from Mississippi and these other states. This has been a deeply coordinated um, movement that has taken foot. And in that way, no, it's not surprising uh, what these conservative justices just did. Adam Serwer wrote so much with regard to the Trump administration, his brilliant observation that I think was incredibly vivid and descriptive of the politics of the Trump administration, the cruelty is the point, that there's a message of power, there's a message of domination um, in showing your disregard and your disdain, and that this is not important. And that's part of what my guess is about why they did it. Um, It's certainly an issue that's important to many of them. We know that abortion is important to Amy Coney Barrett. We know that abortion is important to Brett Kavanaugh. We know that the that this is not something they are not interested in. Um, and so, and and I can't answer, Dahlia. I don't have a great guess about why they did this from a lay person's perspective, who doesn't. Ha- I, I don't have the kind of legal background that you and Michelle do. I think, wow, it feels like this is actually undercutting the court itself. And precedent, even if it's precedent that we may guess they're eager to overturn, and I believe they are eager to overturn it, and I have suspected that they would for a long time. But to say, like, we're not even going to bother to uphold this federal law that that was made by our body, by the Supreme Court, feels to me to be um, self-diminishing 
in some way. And I am confused by it. And this is the conversation we have been having in the car. But we also know that this project, and, and this may be what I, I heard Michelle talking about um, the years of organizing from an anti-abortion movement. There's also been years of organizing by a Republican Party um, to put a court in place um, that would take all of the disdain for reproductive autonomy and reverse row or make it functionally meaningless. Uh, take away, fully take away the rights and access um, to abortion care, um, to full health care. Uh, and this has been a mission of a Republican Party, and we've known it, and it's happened through state legislatures and, and a conservative movement that was obsessed with taking over state legislatures to excellent effect so that you have state legislatures that come up with these wild laws like the one in Texas, um, to taking over the Supreme Court. And a Supreme Court seat that was held hostage by Mitch McConnell in the last year of Barack Obama's term to a Senate that jammed through a replacement for Ruth Bader Ginsburg in the last days of Donald Trump's administration. The Tea Party, this, this has all been in the cover of night stuff that was just barely under the surface of the Republican Party for decades. It was the, the rise of the Tea Party that said it was all about economic conservatism and being worried about taxation, but in fact just got into power. 10 years ago and started voting to defund Planned Parenthood every week. This, I have to say, is, is part and parcel of the general democratic response, the general white male democratic response to the attacks on women's rights to choose over the last 30 or 40 years. Yeah. It's not to aggressively fight for the right um, to family planning and fight for the right for abortions. It is to appear to be protecting the principle without actually putting skin in the game, butts on the line to, to fight and protect women. This is what Democrats do more often than not on this issue. They try to say the nice thing, they try to calm passions, they try to skirt the issue instead of aggressively going out and fighting. And that's why we're here. Because the Republicans, as we've seen in Texas, as we see in Mississippi, as we're about to see in Florida and South Dakota and Missouri and Arkansas, Republicans are out here like they're on crusade. All right? They're, they act like they have the moral high ground. They act like forcing a woman to, give, to bring a pregnancy to term against her will is something that is not barbaric, right. which is beyond me. But they act like they are on some kind of well, holy Ellen, crusade, and Democrats act ashamed that they have to protect women's rights. And this, and this goes way back, Ellie. Back in, in the early 90s, Bill Clinton was talking about how we want to make abortion safe, legal, and rare, which is, again, buying into the frame that there's something wrong with abortion. Obviously, we're talking about pre-viability, and in most cases, substantially pre-viability. But this overwhelmingly emotional argument, combined with the fact that you've got the Catholic Church which has a seat in the United Nations and has no female citizens, but is on the family planning uh, commission at the UN, or at least used to be. I think that you've got a lot of Democratic politicians who are afraid to offend Catholic voters. They, they don't want to lose them. And so they've always tried to have it both ways. Oh, we're trying to keep abortion safe and legal, but you know we kind of agree with you that it's morally something that's a little creepy and we shouldn't have. Instead of saying, right, unwanted pregnancies can be a terrible problem. They can be a life-destroying problem for some people. They can certainly be a life-altering problem for most people. And you have the problem of women who want abortions getting them in unsafe ways, because that's, right, which that's is the whole other thing. That's the dark side of these restrictions. It doesn't stop abortions. It forces women onto the black market where their health it cannot be protected. Correct. Look, for, for, from the perspective of people who claim, and I believe it is just a claim, I do not believe that this should be given the imprimatur of a, a, of a real belief because they don't, because you just got to think it through. But the people who claim that they care about the life of the unborn, here's an idea give $10,000 and free health care to women who want to carry their pregnancy to term. Like, you could do that. If you were so concerned about the care and well-being of unborn people, what you would do was to make sure that the mother was as protected, as healthy, 
as rested as possible in this society. You wouldn't be fighting against a six-week uh, federal family leave policy. You would be demanding one-year paid federal family leave for any woman who wants to bring a pregnancy to term. That's what you do if you care about life. And if you don't care about life, if you only care about controlling women's bodies, that's how you get into $10,000 bounty system for ratting out your neighbor trying to go to the doctor. Let's start using proper language, by the way. Number one, let's stop using the word unborn unless we're talking about viable post-24 week pregnancies. And let's stop referring to a pregnancy as six weeks or eight weeks or 10 weeks as a fetus when in fact it's a zygote. And let's stop referring to heartbeats at six weeks because there is no heart. <laughs> there, there are cells in there that are pulsing with an electrical current because someday they will develop into a heart. The forced birth faction essentially has hijacked language, Ellie. Yeah, and look, again, look, most people in this country, are they think of themselves as somewhere in the middle, right? They want, want abortions to be legal in some cases and to be illegal in other cases. And what those people, for the most part, don't understand is that I have just described the law as it is right now. All Roe v. Wade stands for, like all it stands for, is the concept that the state cannot force a woman to bring a pregnancy to term if she decides to terminate that pregnancy before fetal viability, which scientifically happens around 24 weeks. Fetal viability is the standard. Why? Because fetal viability is the point where scientifically the fetus can exist outside the womb, right? This makes sense. At the point where the thing needs, its, needs the woman to survive, then clearly it is still part of the woman's. At the point where you can take it out, and it can live on its own with medical help, well, then we're in a different situation. Right, and that's where it so goes from being a fetus court, to an unborn child. Right, and that's why the courts have put the demarcation line at fetal viability. After fetal viability, we agree that there is some state interest in blah, 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 blah. Right. Before fetal viability, we agree that women are people, too. Right. It's as simple as that. So the law as it is right now already accounts for this push-pull in American politics with people who want abortions sometimes but don't want abortions other times. That's where we are already. So, Ellie, how do you think this thing is going to play out in Texas legally? I, 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 know, I yeah. believe you're a graduate of the Harvard Law School, if I'm recalling correctly. Indeed, although that's not as sterling credential as it used to be. Look, the, what Biden needs to do is, via executive order, establish federal abortion providers, federal doctors who are through qualified immunity cannot be sued by these private citizens trying to carry on their bounty hunt. That's the quickest way around the Texas law, but none of this stops until Democrats take back the Supreme Court, because if it wasn't this Texas law, the Supreme Court was already poised to overturn Roe v. Wade this June in a case called Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health, which uh, involves a Mississippi law that bans abortion after 15 weeks with no exception for rape or incest. Right. Like, the court was already going to do this, and as long as the Democrats allow Republicans to control the Supreme Court, they will do this. We depend heavily on memberships to fund the production of this show because having principles in the attention economy is bound to cost you, and that's definitely been the case for us. When the company that was selling ads for us way back demanded that we allow our listeners to be tracked and hyper-targeted with manipulative ads, we refused because we find that to be blatantly unethical and in many countries illegal when it's done without the ability to opt in or out, which is the case for all podcasts. Now, because many advertisers have gotten used to being able to hyper-target podcast listeners through other less scrupulous shows, they're less willing to advertise with integrity on shows like ours. This has really been squeezing our finances and making every single supporting member we have that much more critical to our ability to produce this show. If you are a member, thank you once again. If you want to support the work we do, please consider becoming a member at bestofleft.com support. If you'd like to advertise with integrity to our audience while protecting everyone's privacy, you can reach me directly at j at bestofleft.com. Thanks, as always, for your support.
the press, that traditional press that you talk about, what was also frustrating is that you see this kind of uptick between 2010 and 2013, dramatic between that time, 2010 to 13, more anti-abortion, anti-reproductive rights laws that are proposed and enacted than the 30 years prior. And this is during the time that Barack Obama is in office. And there are reporters who are kind of, you know, framing this time of the Tea Party as, well, this is just all politics. And they're divorcing it from the importance of race and being part of this discourse and the ability to use race, weaponize racism, weaponize white supremacy in ways that at that time there were reporters talking about we were post-racial. How wonderful it is. We have a black president. This is the new coming of America. And there were those like you, like me, and that other people were saying, no, look at what this represents. This is actually dangerous what's taking place. And sadly, it's taken a while for traditional news media to catch up. (laughs) It's taken a really, I mean, as part of the traditional news media, I can, and who has been told so many times over you know, I, I guess now I've been writing about this for a couple of decades and who has been told over and over again, some version of you're being hysterical if you think this is what's going on. Right. And in fact, that is certainly you're so right about how the right used Barack Obama's presidency um, and the kind of um, <laughs> the, the willful sleepiness that it engendered on the left and the liberal left. Oh, absolutely. That got to pat itself on the back and say, look at what we helped to do. Right. I mean, it's, it's yes, post-racial, right? Exactly. We elected a black president. Post-racial was white liberals celebrating themselves and saying, look at what we did. We got Barack Obama uh, in the white house while being asleep at the wheel on yes. all of these other fronts. And to be clear, the, the democratic party has played a really crucial part here too and encouraging that sleepfulness, right? Is that a word? I'm very tired. If the press refused to acknowledge what the right was doing in in building its power in state legislatures, in in taking over the court, in moving in this direction, the Democratic Party that was theoretically supposed to be on the side of reproductive rights and autonomy has absolutely refused to fight for them up until as recently as the Amy Coney Barrett confirmation hearing where nobody wanted to have the fight because the Democratic Party has absorbed an inaccurate and incorrect message that people find abortion icky. And I would argue that is because they find, because there is an assumption that anything having to do with women's autonomy um, and human, full and equal human thriving is icky, right, to a lot of people. Um, But the Democratic Party has not fought on this, despite the fact that the legality of abortion is actually one of the most broadly popular issues in this country, even in red states. People, the press, again, would have you believe that the country is irrevocably divided on this, right? That it's 50-50, nobody's ever changing their mind. But in fact, good, smart polling over the past decade has shown that is a myth. Seven in 10 people, even in purple and red states, want abortion to remain legal in some form. And the Democratic Party, despite having that very good, strong evidence in front of them, has refused to fight for abortion rights, for better abortion access. This administration is the first time since the 90s that a budget and it's, you know, has in its first draft not included the Hyde Amendment. The Democratic Party has permitted the Hyde Amendment to be in the budget, you know, through the Obama administration. The Democratic Party has refused to fight for abortion and in fact has contributed to the idea that it is there's something distasteful about it, that there's something icky about it, that it's a cultural issue rather than a key economic issue. The Democratic Party um, has been very much a part of this story, too, and has also been absolutely asleep at the wheel. While this was very clear to many people who weren't listened to and who were called hysterical, literally called hysterical regularly who'd been saying, look, this is what we're building to. This is what's happening. This is what the right is trying to do. And and people who've been saying that were told that they were fantasists, that they were overdramatic, that they were feminized, basically, by saying you're being overdramatic. Rebecca, I'm so, so glad you said this. And I want to stop for a moment and honor the fact that Rebecca and I have stood on many a street corner in Brooklyn and asked each other, 
Am I hysterical right now, having had somebody tweet that at us or shout that at us? Um, so I think it's really important to fold into this conversation how subject uh, you can be to claims that you're overreacting. And and I also want to, on behalf of a lot of the mainstream press, uh, acknowledge the fact that this narrative about this moderate centrist court, this redemption narrative that says that, oh, look at the end of the 2021 term and look at how centrist Brett Kavanaugh was and look how centrist Amy Coney Barrett and look at how they are drawn like magnets to uh, how right the left fundamentally is, how correct the left fundamentally is, and look at how centrists and moderates they, they are. I mean, we, we really, really wanted that story. We peddled that story. The public Right now, Gallup polling is showing that 51 percent of Democrats love the John Roberts court. So we also played a part in that narrative of normalizing and legitimizing a court that was inexorably going to do this and was selected to do this. And I guess under this rubric of gaslighting, I mean, we've talked about the ways in which the court was gaslighting us, the DNC was gaslighting us, the press was gaslighting us. I guess I I want to give both of you a chance to say that just the political system itself kept insisting that there was something about um, the way women were reacting to Brett Kavanaugh, the way they were reacting to Barrett, that was, again, over the top and hysterical, that wasn't uh, sober and legalistic, and that I'm just thinking of you, Rebecca, responding to uh, Ben Sass saying, you know, these women are nuts. Why are they dressed up like handmaids saying that they're going to lose abortion? I mean, the gaslighting all the way down. So there are two instances that I think of. One is that Ben Sass, and that was the, during the Kavanaugh confirmation hearings. In fact, before he was accused of sexual assault um, by Christine Blasey Ford, when protesters were yelling in the chamber about abortion rights, um, Ben Sass, who <laughs> is the senator from Nebraska, who's a history teacher, said this thing from the perspective of historians. Like, for decades, I've been hearing people scream that women are going to die. Where And he used the word hysteria. You think that's an overstatement? No, he used the word hysteria. He said, where does this hysteria come from? Like, this is a ludicrous thing to say, because I've been hearing it for decades. So, so that is this gaslighting. And it's this condescension from the white male Nebraskan senator, or history teacher, you know, with like a Harvard degree or something, who is telling you that you're just crazy if you think that the confirmation of Brett Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court is going to result in harm to women's bodies, rights, and autonomy. So there's that instance. And then I want to bring up another instance that I also can't stop thinking about, which is the end of the Amy Coney Barrett hearing just this past fall, when the Democratic senator from California, Diane Feinstein, reached over and congratulated, as, as many people are watching this, and just gobsmacked that after a Supreme Court seat was kept out of Barack Obama's power, as Barack Obama was prevented by the Senate, by Mitch McConnell, from appointing a justice to fill an empty seat in his last term. And Republicans jammed through Amy Coney Barrett, a known opponent of abortion rights. And the, the Democratic Party, there were a couple of people who really did fight, and I was grateful to them for it. But by and large, the Democratic Party let this happen without saying this is, without saying, no, this is a travesty. This isn't how this works. This isn't, this, this is a horror show. This is what's going to happen. Here are the things that it's, it's abortion, it's voting rights, it's, it's the environment, it's the planet. Without saying all those things as boldly as they should have been saying, they didn't fight. They didn't fight. And at the end of it, you have all these people watching, me watching, my jaw on the floor, thinking, I can't believe this is just happening. And Dianne Feinstein, a Democrat, reaches over and congratulates Lindsey Graham on the, like, the best, smoothest confirmation hearings in her memory. That's gaslighting, too. That's telling all the people who are watching this thinking, oh, my God, I'm seeing the future and I'm seeing our system, our governance, our planet unraveling here in front of me on the television. And a Democratic senator is congratulating a Republican senator on comedy and the smooth operations of the system. That's gaslighting lighting too, just as much as Ben Sass is. As we saw the Texas abortion ban 
is yet a, another reminder of why you hardly ever see female dictators. Americans, like many corners of the world today to varying degrees, from Afghanistan to Russia to Syria to Poland and the United Kingdom and too many other places, are up against the threat of patriarchal terrorism. This is not only a war against women, but a war against LGBTQ people as well, who by their very existence challenge the rigid, harmful confines of who gets to be considered human under a patriarchy. In predominantly white societies trapped under or threatened by patriarchal terrorism, all non-white people are also relegated to objects to ensure the unchecked power of the white male ruling class. Needless to say, Republicans in Texas and elsewhere are determined to drag America back to its roots and calling on vigilantes for help. The Texas abortion ban provides a fancy, institutionalized spin on the increasing white terrorism plaguing our country. The Proud Boys now can rally around the law in Texas and hunt down people even considering getting abortions. This is the type of law they will cling to in order to justify their violence and make it seem no longer fringe, but now part of the establishment. And the Supreme Court, with a cowardly, shadowy abdication of duty to uphold the Constitution, let them do it. The Texas abortion ban is a legalized fascism, and the Supreme Court, packed by an illegitimate president who has a history of keeping a book of Hitler's speeches by his bed, who was raised by an infamous racist, arrested at a KKK rally in New York, refused to stop the fascist Texas abortion ban because fascism is the end goal. If you do not believe us, Google the definition of fascism, and flashing before your eyes will be today's headlines on the growing threat of nationalism in America, the cult worship of a dictatorial leader, violent suppression and harassment of opposition, including the press, racial and other scapegoating, and so forth, the entire Republican agenda is now a fascist white terrorist movement, often hiding behind the veneer of respectability with such harmful groups as now the Supreme Court, the Federalist Society, the Heritage Foundation, Freedom Works, the Family Prayer Breakfast, the Chamber of Commerce, Republican trifecta states, bewildering New York Times columnists, cable news pundits, and a whole list of white men and white women and token minorities who have chosen power and greed over the public good. And they're doing it against the will of much of their hostage states, known as red states. In Texas, for instance, if 11,000, only 11,000 in a state as large as Texas, if only 11,000 votes had flipped across nine districts in 2020, Republicans in Texas wouldn't have had the power to ban abortions and pass one of the most restrictive voter suppression laws in the country. This comes according to a great group we should all be supporting and following called the State Government Citizens Campaign, a group of like-minded people working, volunteers, community organizers working to flip state governments from red to blue to avoid tragedies like what's unfolding in Texas. The Texas abortion ban is legal warfare against our democracy, much like the court packing by the Federalist Society, the voter suppression laws across the country amplifying Trump's big lie, all of that paid for by a massive amount of dark money. Look at Jane Mayer's piece recently in The New Yorker, all about the dark money that's fueling these voter suppression lies, all based on Trump's big lie that the 2020 election was stolen from him and justifying expanding voter suppression laws and putting the power of our elections in the hands of right-wing partisan ideologues. It's the same legal warfare you see in authoritarian states and declining democracies like Viktor Orban's Hungary, where opposition leaders faced intrusive and expensive audits, for instance. Authoritarianism isn't always tanks and brutality. It's also really expensive lawsuits and investigations and, like I said, financial audits. All of this is done to financially ruin and harass and demoralize and crush the opposition, completely ruin their lives, and therefore they don't have any energy or any resources left to fight the authoritarianism. This is what we're seeing now in Texas, where anyone can turn in others for getting an abortion or helping someone, even an Uber driver, can be sued. And those lawsuits can earn the bounty hunters 
thousands of dollars. These vigilante laws, like the Texas abortion ban, aren't limited to abortion. Republicans are also going after the rights of local governments to pass mask mandates, ensure environmental protections, and so forth. Using vigilantes to carry out their culture of fascism, these vigilante laws are dangerous loopholes in our Constitution. They're steamrolling our Constitution. Our Constitution protects us from the state, or it should, but these vigilante laws empower individuals to bully others and literally destroy people's lives. As designed by the Republican hijacking of our democracy, any right-wing ideological judge, like the majority of the Supreme Court and roughly one-third of judges packed onto the courts by Trump and Mitch McConnell, can look the other way, claiming individual rights, free speech, relig religious freedom, and that they're just standing their ground. Currently, a Texas state judge temporarily halted uh, the rights of Texas right to life and its associates from suing workers and abortion providers at Planned Parenthood. That's a very small but much-needed reprieve. TikTok activists have flooded the Gestapo website where people can report anyone trying to get an abortion or helping someone get an abortion. A clever young person who represents the hope of our nation this young person by the name of Sean Black created a bot that lets you flood the Gestapo website with spam. GoDaddy, the company that hosts this website, the Gestapo website in Texas, kicked the Texans' fascist movement off of its platform refu and refuses to provide their services now. Uber and Lyft promised to pay the legal fees of any drivers sued as part of the Texas abortion ban. So there are always creative ways to fight back. Just like when Trump tried to pass a Muslim registry and suddenly non-Muslims started registering and, and flooding the system. We've just heard clips today, starting with Counterspin, giving the details of the Texas abortion law. Amicus compared the Texas law to the Fugitive Slave Act. Counterspin explained the difference between the legality and actual lived accessibility of abortion services. Amicus also addressed the role of race and disregard for health outcomes in abortion restrictions. The Takeaway described the surveillance infrastructure that already exists surrounding abortion clinics. Amicus looked at the role of the GOP and Republican Supreme Court justices. The Tom Hartman program focused on the failure of Democrats to stand up for abortion rights, and Amicus explained the Democrats' tendency to have fallen asleep on the issue in the face of endless gaslighting. Finally, and fittingly, Gaslit Nation drew the line between vigil anti-abortion laws, white terrorism, and creeping fascism. That's what everyone heard, but members also heard bonus clips providing some more historical context, with Amicus describing the deeply anti-black mother sentiments of the 80s and 90s stemming from the war on drugs that fed into the normalization of the policing of women's bodies. The race part of the story is really important because this all has been built on the surveillance, the stalking, the criminalization, the civil punishment of Black women, and the failure to recognize that the very earliest attempts then, and of course we could say the earliest attempts were during slavery, where we just normalize that Black women have no control over their reproductive autonomy, but certainly in the 1980s when prosecutors began to say, we can use existing child abuse statutes to come after you um, and to say that a fetus is a child in that way. And the takeaway described the network of illegal abortion providers in Chicago that were forced to exist before the ruling in Roe versus Wade. We started just sussing out the underground abortion providers in the city of Chicago to find the ones that were the most reputable, um, honest and competent and to prepare women uh, for their experience and send them off to these providers. But what was unusual about Jane was within two years, and really by the time I joined in the fall of 1971, the women in the group had learned themselves how to perform DNC abortions and induced miscarriages. So we became a completely women-run 
underground abortion service in the city of Chicago. To hear that and all of our bonus content delivered seamlessly into your podcast feed, sign up to support the show at bestofleft.com slash support or request a financial hardship membership because we don't make a lack of funds a barrier to hearing more information. Every request is granted, no questions asked. And now, we'll hear from you. Hi, Jay. This is Scott from Canada. Here are some thoughts on a theory of change. Sometimes, change requires a moderate approach. Sometimes, change requires a more militant approach. It is difficult to know when either approach is optimal. In fact, understanding the distinction between an issue on which moderation is more appropriate than militancy might be the central problem that a theory of change needs to solve. Here's just a little nudge to help crack this nut. The average political actor just wants to be moderate. That is the baseline of political decency. The average anti-choice actor will indicate support for abortion in cases of rape, a moderate position, only because they have an aversion to appearing militant. The average anti-racist actor might oppose Colin Kaepernick's demonstrations. Again, a moderate position, because militancy is distasteful. I want to suggest that, when we evaluate a theory of change, and we find ourselves drifting to a more moderate position, are we doing so out of a misplaced emphasis on the value of moderation for moderation's sake? To the anti-choice actor, I would point out that it is nonsensical to permit abortion in a case of rape. If life is sacred, what difference does it make if the pregnancy is the result of rape or of consensual sex? To the anti-racist actor expressing disapproval of Kaepernick's demonstrations, I'm not sure what I would say. I stumbled across that one in the book, some of us, and I thought to myself, this person is mistaking moderation for a virtue. He needs some more militancy. In conclusion, everyone should check their theory of change to make sure they aren't engaging in moderation for the sake of moderation. Stay awesome. Hey, Jay. I think you might have been speaking as a part of what I called what you played on the show to say. Because my point is that the people who advocate that are congressional leaders should get paid less, have a poor theory of change. It's not really a good idea. It just feels good to them, and it feels good to us, but it's a bad idea. But your response was seemingly, I don't know, the response seemed to be that like I was having that idea, which I'm not. I'm having, I was calling with the opposite idea to complain about the idea that I see that meme I don't know, every three months about how we should pay Congress less. And while that feels just really good, I was just having some common ground with any sort of right winger. I do think that is a poor idea and was looking to see if anybody had a theory of change actually that suggested it was a good idea. If that's possible, if that's, if it could be a good idea, potentially just to challenge my own to challenge myself and also I just called in to, to rant about that idea so just thought your reaction was a little weird because it sounded like I was calling in to suggest that we should make legislatures legislators get paid less which was not what I was doing I was actually ranting about it and being as charitable towards that side as possible okay take care man bye Thanks to all those who called into the voicemail line or wrote in their messages to be played as voicemails. If you'd like to leave a comment or question of your own to be played on the show, you can record a message at 202-999-3991 or write me a message to j at bestofleft.com. First of all, to put Nick's fears to rest, I went and listened back to my commentary that, that he was referring to the last time he called in and I responded to him and another person who had written in on a similar topic. The other person was talking about term limits and the downsides of that. Nick called in, talked about reducing congressional pay and the downsides of that. I responded to both. And I don't know what happened. I, I don't know why it sounded confusing, but it, it did. And uh, I absolutely saw myself on the side of both Jonathan from New York talking about term limits and Nick talking about the wrongheadedness of 
reducing congressional pay, or, or at least the short-sightedness of it and the possibility of it stoking corruption. And so I went on to talk about the importance of having a theory of change and those being great examples of how a, a lack of a well-thought-through theory of change can result in really poor policy, so poor, in fact, that it actually backfires from <laughs> what the people are intending. So as I say, I don't know what happened. One of my least favorite things is misunderstandings. I find them incredibly frustrating, making it deeply ironic that I went ahead and made myself a political commentator on the internet, of all places. As for Scott, I think he is absolutely right that politicians tend to look to be in the center of any room they happen to be in. That's why they change what they say, depending on what room they're in. And militaristic actions are often a strategy to shift the Overton window, pulling the center toward your cause, so that moderates, when they are trying to find the center, will shift in your direction as the Overton window shifts in your direction. So when you see actions that seem radical or shock and horror, impolite. Keep in mind what the purpose is. For instance, a politician who agrees that there should be exceptions to abortion restrictions in the case of rape or incest get to say that while making it sound like a gift they're granting because of the hardcore militant forced birth advocates who are incredibly loud in the ears of those politicians. As discussed in today's show, even the left has been buying into the right-wing frame on abortion for decades with all of our talk of safe, legal, and rare, and that language has only recently begun to shift because of the more radical elements of reproductive justice advocates getting as loud as they possibly can in order to shift that narrative. And I think the problem the left falls into a lot is the idea that because our policies are so much more popular than the right, we should be able to win over support while being polite. Hey, hey, don't don't ruffle feathers, don't don't be so loud, don't be angry, like we're right. Let's just let's just get everyone to agree with us. And it doesn't really work that way. The other side yells a lot louder than we do on the specific issues that they really care about, and their echo chamber is designed to make people a lot angrier than the media on the left generally does. And that's why more radical approaches almost always need to be part of a theory of change. It probably shouldn't be the only element. You know, we need political strategy to get actual laws passed, too. But when it comes to messaging— a bit of militarism is almost always a good thing to pull the Overton window and moderate politicians along with it in our direction. As always, keep the comments coming in at 202-999-3991 or by emailing me to j at bestofleft.com. Thanks to everyone for listening. Thanks to Dion Clark and Aaron Clayton for their research work for the show and participation in our bonus episodes. Thanks to the monosyllabic transcriptionist trio, Ben, Ken, and Scott, for their volunteer work helping put our transcripts together. Thanks to Amanda Hoffman for all of her work on our social media outlets, activism segments, graphic designing, webmaster and bonus show co-hosting. And thanks to those who support the show by becoming a member or purchasing gift memberships at bestofleft.com slash support or from right inside the Apple Podcasts app. Membership is how you get instant access to our impressively good bonus episodes in addition to there being extra content and no ads in all of our regular episodes. For details on the show itself, including links to all of the sources and music used in this and every episode, all that information can always be found in the show notes on our website and likely right on the device you're using to listen. So coming to you from far outside the conventional wisdom of Washington, D.C., my name is Jay, and this has been the Best of the Left podcast, coming to you twice weekly, thanks entirely to the members and donors to the show from bestoftheleft.com. Bestoftheleft.com